uh, looking around Aval uh, on North Uist um, for the last oh, 12 months or so uh, to find out a little bit more about it. Um, so who are we? Well, there are three of us, we're all retired, and uh, well, I've taken on the role of Piper. <laughs> So where are we looking? Um, South Uist you probably know, it's up here in the West Niles, uh, and going a little closer, the area we're interested in is this area here. Um, beautiful area, about 50% of it is water, um, and there's just so much of it, and nobody living there, and very few people even walking or exploring. Um, it just is stunning, and you never know what you're going to find around the next corner. Um, so why? As Simon says, it's a large area and really very little recorded. Um, it's also a nice area to go walking, to be honest, so we're not minding that at all. So you can see, it's a stunning spot. Part of it is 30 square kilometres, um, 23 camel entries, we think. Um, we know two characters. Though. And you can see there that the dots of the camel entries and that red dotted line is our sort of a boundary of where we've been going. Hasn't been visited by professionals since 1963, we think. It could be wrong, I think we told wrong, but that's what we think is the case. It's very unrecorded, undiscovered, and wild country. The problem is access. The yellow lines there are roads, which are all right in the car. The red lines, that bottom one is a three hour walk if you want to go from one end to the other. Um, and there's no other path other than just crossing the otherwise. So it's quite a remote part of the country. Well, luckily, we have a solution, and this side of my right owns a boat. So we use the boat, there you see getting in and out of the boat. And that's some of the route you take on the boat to get in there. So it's not quite so bad for us with the boat as it perhaps would be if you were up there for holiday or sleep for you. Um, makes it a bit easier. What have we been doing? So in terms of uh, looking at the, uh, the area in terms of desktop work, we start off, as I'm sure most people do, with a piece of work that's kind of can walk. Um, I don't, I'm sure most of you have heard of Erskine Beveridge, who was a well-known archaeologist who lived on well, I wouldn't call him Mark Holders, but a business person who lived on North Hills at the turn of the century, and he did a lot of work, a lot of recording, and in fact, a lot of the things that we have found already found by him. Then we have, there's very little mapping before this time here in 1800, but this is one map that we've been able to get from the Scottish Records Office, from, uh, surveyed in 1799, and this has been quite informative for some of our work. We've got the OS 6 inch first edition, which is one of the last, I think, surveyed in Scotland, uh, surveyed in 1876 and published in 81. I'm not sure that many places are actually done after that. Um, but of course, what we have to hand is the, uh, the wonderful satellite imagery we can now use. And this is a typical area, part of the survey area, and you can see the yellow rings. So none of these are recorded on camera, and I think even you from the audience can actually start to see things on the pictures there that uh, we can find. In particular, I just point out that's a very large building that wasn't actually even picked up in the, in the guard um, work um, 10 or 15 years ago. So what we do is we plan a route, we find the targets with satellite imagery, as I say, and then we plan the routes, uh, which are the blue lines, which we then record where we've been. And once found, we locate by GPS, we photograph them, we take photography for 3D modeling, and science is going to talk about that in a minute. We sketch and measure, and then when we're on site, we usually stand around and have a chat about what we think we found, but none of us are qualified, we're all just simply amateur, interested people, so we have no, we bring no expertise to that, apart from our enthusiasm. And as time has progressed, we actually find getting a little bit better at it. Now, as far as recording is concerned, um, we have set up a Google Map and database, and you can see the blue lines are the wall routes, the red lines are the things we found. There's a yellow thing there, which is in fact a camel site. And then you can see the little data uh, slide on the right-hand side, and that's where the information is loaded up. So we put up the text, it's got the really coordinates, we've got photographs or drawings or anything else. And this, in fact, is open to anybody. In fact, if you go on to, our, go on to it, we'll give you the reference for it. You can actually see everything we found and get access to it. We use Flickr photo, uh, photo screen for sharing photographs, because we all take photographs. And right after be in touch afterwards, we just load them all up on here. This is actually a recent visit we've been, no, recent post we've visited. And then this is our Simon doing some 3D uh, modeling photography work. And Simon's just going to talk about that now for a bit, how we do that. OK, very quickly on the, the 3D modeling. We're using photogrammetry and uh, Microsoft Photoscan. And we use a, a pole with a GoPro camera to just record a series of photos for a site by walking around it and taking a photograph every half second. It takes about um, three to five minutes to record the average site. Um, and we'll get some very accurate 3D models from that. Um, they're loaded up on the computer, so you can see how they form this scroll around the site. The software gives a wireframe and then a pictorial representation once you remove the, the cameras. Um, it's really an excellent model that you can look at in the comfort of your own home. It doesn't matter if it's raining or not, you can still do the examination. 
and uh, look at it from any angle and see a lot of things that you just wouldn't have seen in the field because you, you weren't there for more than a few minutes. We also then go on to plan for the more interesting areas or sites. This was an interesting township that appeared on the 1799 map in the pre-crofting and then further north there's a second area of housing which was post crofting so you can see the history of the buildings there there's all sorts of, all sorts of other things in that area we mark on, on, on that map a more detailed section of what we're looking at we take that on and then go to individual townships i suppose and there's a plan david Dean, retired architect has these sort of skills i certainly don't have in drawing plans and we, we create more detailed plans and going right down to the site level there there's a plan of one of the various sites we found out there so for most of the interesting stuff we've got this is the sort of record we created and put online for people to see the 3D imagery helps you create an aerial model without getting an aeroplane involved. That's one of our ones there. We've also tried to help, like we sought help of getting people out. John Raymond gets his fourth mention today. I think today I'll be looking to people out to visit us. Um, and there's another of the local archaeologists out there just trying to give us a few tips as well. We're looking at the right place and seeing the right sort of, of things. We've also very definitely tried to talk to some of the locals. This is Alistair McDonald, whose daughter, Kirsten, I think, works at Historic Environment Scotland. So there's a good link there for us as well. Um, and he is the last, he is the person who decides that the rights for a lot of land for sheep in this particular part. But we interviewed a couple of ruins he'd never seen before and never knew were there, etc. So he is useful in the oral tradition in terms of Celtic, but not perhaps going back further than that. Um, but he also loved his day out, which is a good thing. Then we'll take you on to David. So uh, where existing camel entries uh, exist, we put more information in, we make corrections, or we add information as necessary. Uh, we're very big fans of Sharp, and because, because we're working on a very indented coastline, we get a lot of coastal records, and all those get loaded up into Sharp. We probably had a, at least 75 of those. I mean, this is some of the early ones we did. Uh, we, have, we put some stuff into DES, and we, every now and again we produce a short report. Um, the, the one on the right is for a particularly interesting site, and the one on the right is a, pre a preliminary sort of summary we did quite recently. I'm now going to talk about the survey summary very quickly. We've got a lot of slides to get through, so I'm going to talk quickly and click quickly. So these are the 25 listed Canmore sites. The yellow are Iron Age or earlier, the blue are later, I've got that rather, I have this. The, the blue are post Iron Age, the yellow are pre. Um, there are seven dunes, and the red dots show where they are. Here's one. There's another one, they're fairly typical. I know they don't exist in lots of parts of Scotland, but there are about 200 on use, so these are not uncommon, because these are actually in quite good condition, because they're so remote. We've got two townships, Roger's mentioned these already, and that's that map again, we'll come back to that later. That's the two townships. We've got three caves. I think these are really interesting, because I don't think they've been visited by actually anyone. And they were recorded by the crofter who told um, Beveridge about them, that there was bones and pottery, all that kind of thing in the cave, and no one's ever <coughs> even been to look at them, so I think they're really interesting. That's the other one. They're not particularly big, but um, you can see that this one on the right, you have to climb, literally climb up a face to get to, so it's not even having animals in. We've got three cans. This is a long can, which is a relatively recent discovery. It's got a lot of sheetings on the top, we'll come back to that later. This is, a, I think it's described as a Neolithic can, but again, it's been messed around a lot and got sheetings and things on the top. We've got three enclosures. This is a big uh, Victorian age enclosure up on the hill. Um, this is a small one, which is really interesting, and it's got some other features to it. It's on a kind of a mound. And this is a tiny little one describing Camerall's enclosure, but it's actually just a tiny little four-wall thing on an island. This is, this is actually in the lock, and we did went to this by rowing boat. So we did a tour of the lock by rowing boat, looking at the islands. And these are those sundries. There's a promontory fort, which actually isn't one. We've got a rock-cut bowl that an arrowhead was found, and one sheeting. And we'll just show you the rock-cut bowl, because it's a particularly beautiful thing. There aren't many sort of seriously marked stones on here. You can see the black thing, and there's a lens cap there. It's about sort of 100 mm diameter, but it's absolutely geometrically perfect. And it's very close to that big long cane I showed you just now. And this is a, three, this is a 3D model clip produced by 3D photogrammetry, and you can see the bowl there. It's, it's just a lovely, lovely thing. I presumably connected to the barrow in some way. That's a particularly interesting find. And then for our, for our own, this is our own record. So the red sites are everything that we found, 185 in total. We've got uh, caves, uh, right, I'm going to go through this in age now very quickly, and um, we are not experts, so we're guessing now. Uh, possible Mesolithic, we don't know, caves obviously, um, but also, which we've seen already, but rock shelters. We found a large number of rock shelters. This is a particularly interesting example, and there's got a shell scattering inside, which is quite interesting. Um, we're hoping that someone will come and look at this properly, because we found several of them like this, and that's the new cave we found. We've got, uh, then we've got the Neolithic period, we found what we think are some more cairns. Simon, can you just move forward? Um, 
And this is, in fact, a couple of um, 18th century houses, which are on so much stone, they probably are cans, because there's, there's a lot more stone there than the houses. And we've got what we think might be the remains of a stone circle, but we don't really know. And then in the Bronze Age, um, somebody was asking me earlier about roundhouses. So, we, um, so these are the two that we found, um, which is quite extraordinary, really, because on the mainland and sky nearby, there are a huge number. But we have actually only found these two. You can just see it's very faint sort of outline there, kind of oval. And then there's a little bit there, the sort of extension. Not really sure about that. And then we come to the Iron Age. Um, John Raven used this phrase. I think it's a very good one. The Iron Age weird stuff, <coughs> which Roger's going to talk about in a minute. And this is part of it, because this is, this is just who knows what this is. It's passages and bits of stone and a lot of stuff on the hilltop that's never been seen before. And then this is fairly typical. Under most buildings, under most houses, we'll find other stuff obviously lying underneath. And you can see the circular structures there. And when John came to look at this, he thought maybe there's some medieval stuff in here too. And this house is probably 18th or 19th century. And then Pictish, and then very few Pictish remains on here. But an archae another archaeologist came and said that this little rectangular structure in here, you can see that may be the remains of the Pictish cairn, with this other building built over the top of it. And then she also thought this might be a Pictish burial ground with these sort of rather rectangular graves on a hillside near a little harbour. Um, there are quite a few of those, and that's a possibility between those. Norse. We used to say we think we can smell the smog spilled when we walk around this area because it feels as though the Vikings had to be there. And again, Viking remains on the earth are very difficult to find, but the carvers and the inlets things are so good. And this is one building, um, again, that John helped us identify as being certainly medieval. And this is, a t this is one of the houses on Norse houses on South Hughes was excavated. And the comparison with Odin and Canning, we just thought this was, you know, pre crofting settlement. We had no idea. So that's really interesting. This is another thing quite nearby there, which is. Um, possible sheeting, and this was identified by Patricia Kupiek at Aberdeen as bearing a strong resemblance to, this is an, an Icelandic Norse sheeting that she was working on. We've got Norse, we have plenty of this kind of thing, boat pulling out areas. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the mapping now. Um, so the mapping is um, not, very, uh, not very well done. We've got one reference here to Loch Abyssary, which is the loch next to our site, up next to our area. But all this is all rather inaccurate, with north to the right, of course, this is Plough from 1650. This is a more accurate representation of our area, just here, from 1789. We've seen the Reed map already um, from 1799, and we've used this has been very helpful because on this you can start to see boundaries of different settlements and grazing areas, and we've been able to identify these from oral history and what's known about the area. So these boundaries are all still extant. You can see the, the uh, not walls, but usually peat banks. And this is a kind of summary of the kind of settlement that's happening around just before 1800. We've got Sheelings, we've got actual settlement, we've got kelping, which was very pro uh, prominent on the US in those days, and fishing things as well. And this is fairly typical, so we've got this, the Fisherman's Inn I referred to before. It's a very large building, completely unrecorded. It's probably one of the biggest 17th century buildings on the US. Um, this is another house, um, which is left over from... I'm not going to this thing. Okay, we've got some uh, kelping structures, and then we've got the post-clearance settlement, um, which is when the, the uh, sheetings and some of the stuff were used. And then this is how it finally ended up. And this is the final photograph, people living in this area until about 1950 when they finally moved away. So we're going to talk about site special interest, and Simon's going to do this first. Okay, this is a, a chance find. Um, just, I was actually trying find to find one of the caves on uh, Avon, um, and came across this site here. Uh, looks really interesting. Um, there it is. Um, a couple of stones in the ground with heather over them. Uh, the ground very uneven, um, and then perhaps a, what could be a hint of a wall there. Uh, but most interesting of all, big voids. My hiking pole is about a metre and a half in length, and there were several of these voids underneath the, the heather. So we got some advice from a local archaeologist. We um, did a 3D scan, and uh, we were told, well, if you want to uh, trim back the heather, do a bit of gardening. So we, uh, we did. And we, we went back, and these are the scans. This is our uh, day one scan when we found it. We went back, and we, we went back on four occasions, in fact, to uh, do a little bit more gardening of each, fighting off the midges. And eventually, we've got something which is identifiable as a site, undoubtedly. Um, there it is. It's circular-ish. It's a roundhouse. It's a prehistoric origin. I suspect that because it's not being robbed out of all its stone, it just collapsed after it was abandoned. There's so much there that we can't make head or tail of it. Um, so 
if anyone has some ideas, please share them with us. My favourite site, I think probably our favourite site, is well, some stone structures on top of the hill. <coughs> that's what I suspect somewhere. Um, we did a desktop survey of the Bay Morag area, as it's called. Absolutely nothing on Campbell. Absolutely nothing on the Ordnance Survey map. We go to the satellite image. You'd some, you might just spot top right hand corner there, there's something that's blown up. So we thought we might go for that. In fact, what we found is in the red box here. And when we mapped it out, it doesn't give you much, this first plan of it overall, that it is a planet. You can see some circular structures there. I'm going to zoom into some details of those in a minute. We created a, a plan, a survey from that, that shows you there three clumps of structures. I've got some images of two of those. One of which was a nice beehive structure there on top of the, the hill. Um, we modelled it to see how accurate these models and useful these models could be. There's our model of that same thing um, taken. Whatever. The, the photographs clear up, but at the same time, you can't go back and change the image you're taking when you're back at home. So that we liked. And I like particularly is some circular features in passage. No idea what they are. That's a plan of it. Um, but to give you an idea, a better idea, it possibly what actually looks like that's a picture from a drone of it. You can see. Um, the circular pit there with this long passage down here. There are some lintly sort of things that have fallen in there. Um, and there's another passage down here, a bit more hidden in the heather. We haven't cleared heather away from this side, so I don't really know what that is. Um, and I mean, you just know anybody does have an idea what that is. We'd love to know. Um, there is our plan of it. Um, that, that's our 3D model of it. You can see the second pit there. And for me, you can just see it there. That, let's look at that. I'll zoom in on that for you on the plan. I'll try and zoom in on that one. There you go. You might see it there. That, I think, for us, is for the, yeah, the iconic site. For us, it actually is a Quernstone to grind it situ. There it is. That's we, we came across that on our first visit to this site with the, the, the grinder snow situ. What is it? Um, we don't really know. The saddle stones went out, or they say, in the Rotary Quernstone period about 200 BC, so there's possible evidence it was in use before that date. I would say by the, the ankle breaking nature of the terrain there, which is full of rocks, it, there must be enough stones there on similar sites you'd have thought that some sort of bronze age care has been reused. It hasn't got that green settlement stuff you see so often in the Hebrides, so it was probably no longer used post, well, in the, the medieval period, but really, and, and as a consequence, it hasn't been robbed as, as much as some of these sites have, but as I said before, we really have not seen anything similar. Okay, um, we had a little bit more to show you, particularly about shootings, but we've run out of time. But anyway, thank you very much.